Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio. Reporting from the basement of the Dairy Civic Center, this is CM Alexander with the news. The Dairy Ladies Society is seeking volunteers for an upcoming fundraiser for Dairy Canal Days. We hope by calling alumni from Dairy High, we can urge them to return and support their hometown. Make sure they haven't forgotten about us, said Chairwoman Shirley Jameson with a cold, joyous laugh. We know many who leave Dairy rarely return, but there's something magic about coming home when called upon. You're listening to Dairy Public Radio. This is Dairy Public Radio. Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio, a bi-weekly Stephen King Book Club podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Joshua Kahn, alongside CM Alexander. Hello, everyone. And Benjamin Graham. Hey, constant readers. And today, we are starting a new book. We are going with our Patreon selection series, a uh, selection from Rachel Jansen, who has selected it. Guys, we're doing it. And for this don't, episode... Don't put it that way. <laughs> we'll be covering uh, chapters one through five, so spoilers for the book ahead. And we have CM leading our discussion. CM, take it away. Thanks, Josh. You guys, this is a big one, and I don't just mean because it's like 1,100 some pages. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it was published in 1986, and it was King's 22nd book. And when I saw that, I was like, wait a minute. We have like 20 some books that we've covered on our on our episodes, right? About. Could it be? So I did the math and you guys, we have covered 24 books. <laughs> so <laughs> close. Wouldn't wow, that that's been a cool. Uh, yeah, that was that was a big build up for Wait, uh, are you counting everything as eventual even though we've only done a few if, of those? If you count everything's eventual and nightmares and dreamscapes, we've done 26. So wow, close. overshot it. I know, yeah. There's no perfect answer here. Uh, so I, I just wanted to kick the episode off with our near miss. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason that I say that this is a big one is because it has so many themes that in his earlier work, you kind of get hints at things. And then eventually they these things become staples, kind of like after it. They really mm-hmm. become staples. And I just think that's cool. And so I was thinking about our listeners a lot because of that. And I'm reading and listening to the book. And I was thinking about the people who are experiencing this for the first time, like versus people who have read it. You know, this is their like second, third or fourth time. Like, this is my fourth time through this. How mm. many times have you guys read it? This will be my third. This my, will be my second. Nice. It, th- see, that's why I consider this a big episode mm-hmm. is not only, uh, you know, thickness of the book, like you said, this is like peak Mm -hmm. this is i i would even dare to say stephen king's like peak stephen king ness this is the most iconic book just even as excited as i was to read the stand i think i am several times more excited to get started here yeah and and whether this is for listeners your first time experiencing it with us on the show or you've done it a thousand times like we have this book is so full of turns of phrase that are just poetic and the imagery is so powerful that i think regardless of what your experience is with us with this it's going to be a lot of fun and amazing no matter what so just clearing the air (laughs) you were looking at me weird so i felt like i had to no (laughs) no this is it's uh I have a rule for first dates is you start off being like, hey, guys, guys, because you're dating multiple people. (laughs) You're like, hey, gang, it's just, you know, it's I'm feeling a little nervous, but it's going to be a good time. And that's why every date I've ever been on has been bad. (laughs) (laughs) It might be the multiple people. Yeah, that's true. I don't want to pick apart your dating life. I should tell them that we're uh, dating Mm -hmm. before I walk up to a (laughs) table at Denny's and and just announce this. Uh, We got to put a pin in this and come back to it later. (laughs) As I want to know more. Yeah, We'll talk about my dating life when we're not talking about the best book. Okay, so we open the story with an unknown narrator, which is something King often does, that third-person omniscient point of view. I always love it because it gives us so much information, and it's rich information that as we're reading it, we're not aware of the important parts. And then as you go through, you're picking up on these elements, 
And even though it was just literally handed to you, it at least makes me feel smart. I go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> we learned that our story is going to take place in two separate time periods, primarily. So 1957-ish and 1984-ish. And both of which we're going to kick off with a heart-wrenching tragedies, just brutal, brutal murders. And we're also going to learn that the town of Derry has just experienced in 1957 this amazing flood. Amazing and, is an interesting choice. Well, where in, it's in like, fistfuls of concrete are being ripped up in the I street. I mean, it's amazing in the turn of phrase that, like, I would be amazed that's, at the I devastation. Guess that's true. I just said a lot of other really big words. And I, <laughs> I know. It's it's the capital G great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so we meet one of our main characters, Bill Denbro, and his adorable little brother, Georgie. How would either of you guys describe these two characters and their relationship? They are so cute. Mm, yeah. <laughs> their relationship is so touching, arguing over who has the biggest, brownest butthole, <laughs> uh, <laughs> calling each other buttholes, and them just cracking up because they're eight and they're what, eight and ten? Six and ten. Mm -hmm. it, it's the kind of relationship that makes me wish for a brother. You know, yeah. I love my little sister to death, but like this is so <laughs> like seems so quintessential brother interaction that it makes me feel like I missed out. Yeah, I'm also I don't know if you guys struggled with this as much as I have been. I wouldn't say struggle, but doing it this far far into our podcast we've discussed so many books that have become come before and after have you guys been struggling to take this book as itself because like you said uh cm there are so many things that king uses in other books like this relationship between bill and georgie used to much lesser effect in Tommyknockers. Mm -hmm. The brothers from Tommyknockers, mm -hmm. it was one of my favorite parts, is their relationship was mm -hmm. so, so real. And so I, I kind of struggled a few parts in this book to be like, wow, this is, he, he really kind of self-plagiarized <laughs> later on <laughs> with this. For me, being the one leading it, that's come through in that I'm really struggling with, like, doing my notes, you know, there are so many parts and I had a conversation with the patron about this too, where I just want to say, well, everybody who would listen to this knows this. And it's like, <laughs> no, treat it, treat it like we do all of our books, talk right. about each section. Cause I keep wanting, I kept, I kept wanting to type in, oh, and you guys know about this. Yeah, you know, it's, like, it's not going to be helpful. Especially <laughs> this scene right off the bat. It's iconic. Everybody, the most iconic yeah. King scene. Let's talk about what happens to Georgie. We, we've got the setup of him and his brother. It's, there's no power. It's a rainy day, but the storm is kind of making its way out of Derry. Bill is sick, but he and his brother are still finding something fun to do together. <laughs> and this also gives us one of our favorite King staples of, and Bill never saw him again, which mm. never gets any easier. <laughs> No, the <laughs> foreshadowing in this book is so good. <laughs> it is so having seen the you know the original miniseries and then the uh, it remakes, we've we've seen the SS Georgie scene so many times, and it is so much better in the book than I remember. Yeah, <laughs> like the it's the small details. The boat runs into the drain the drain pipe, and so he can't get to it. And suddenly, Pennywise is there, and he sees like scary yellow eyes at first, and then they become his mom and Bill's eyes. Like those little mm -hmm. things that, as you read him, read Georgie discovering this information, really lets you see why it sets him at ease. And it's written in such a perfect childlike voice mm -hmm. because when he sees Pennywise for the first time, when we see it, it's startling. He's startled because he sees a clown in the sewer where a clown shouldn't be, but he doesn't run. He doesn't scream. He just looks at it and thinks, huh, mm -hmm. that's weird. And when he starts smelling circus smells, he just gets excited yeah. that, hey, there's a circus in the sewer. Neat. <laughs> and it is very, feels very real. 
before we even get to what's about to happen, which never gets easier <laughs> reading this through, the, this is our first, I feel like our first real turtle reference to. Yeah, in this I book. was shocked. I didn't realize it came this early. Yeah, he, and, and that's why I, I like this book so much because it really does take its time building up to things. Because before this moment, this big epic scene where Georgie meets it for the first time, well, the first and only time for him, <laughs> when he meets it, he's they're building their boat and they're uh, melting paraffin and waterproofing it so mm -hmm. it won't just sink right away because newspaper does not like water. <laughs> and he has to go down into the cellar to get the supplies and their powers out. And he does that thing where he tries to flip the switch, which when we every time, you know, every yeah. time, and he sees a can of turtle wax and the turtle is on that. And he kind of loses himself in this for like 30 solid seconds. And then later as they're doing other things, he's still thinking about the turtle and it's, and that's going to come up over and over again <laughs> for all of our yep. characters. It's, it's pretty much the only turtle we get in this first section right well stan patty talks about oh, stan the right the turtle it. couldn't help us yeah that's right but yeah it, it becomes such a major thing at the end of the book mm -hmm. that having the first turtle reference i was like i don't think i caught that the first Probably time not, yeah <laughs> also having come to this book right after dreamcatcher and making the uh the joke about the aliens being cousins how did we not bring up that Pennywise is Mr. Gray. We touched on that briefly. I think Did we referenced it uh, because there's, oh no, yeah, we, we didn't. didn't mention that his name is Bob his name is Gray. Bob Gray. Yeah, because they're like people online too have tried to tie that into one of the later Dark Tower series. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just as I re I was reading that I was like, <laughs> oh my god, I forgot his real name <laughs> or his quote unquote real yeah, name. His, mm -hmm. his most human name yeah. that he uses. <laughs> This scene is brutal. The sewer scene, listening to it and reading it, both equally terrifying. What do you guys think of the moment? <laughs> I What I like about the version in the book, so Pennywise tears Georgie's arm off uh, at the socket and Georgie essentially goes insane. Like he, Georgie dies, he lets out a scream and dies. What's great about this in the novel, in the movies, it's, you know, Georgie's dead camera moves away. But what you get in the novel is that 45 seconds after that scream, an adult did run out and mm -hmm. did and was people were on the scene right One away. One of his neighbors is like standing at their doorway looking at him mm -hmm. as the screaming starts. Mm -hmm. And by the time he reaches the street, he's dead. Yeah. The quickness and brutality and the complete helplessness mm -hmm. of even you're not even safe while being watched directly. During the day with adults all around who can get to you in less than a minute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Horrifying. So now we I really like this. We cut 27 years later, the final day of the Dairy Canal Days. It's an annual five day festival. And we open with another tragedy. We're going to meet quite a few people because Don Haggerty, a gentleman being interviewed at the police station, his boyfriend, Adrian Mellon, was just murdered horribly by a group of teen bullies. We don't have to remember all their names, but I'm going to throw them out there. A 17-year-old Steve DeBay, 15-year-old Christopher Unwin, and I think 17 or 18, I don't recall it being said, John Webby Garten, sort of the ringleader of these this group of boys and so steve and chris as they're being interrogated you know don is being talked to by the police they're being interrogated in separate rooms and i don't know that i'd call it remorse but they they're upset and they're crying and saying oh we didn't mean to kill him and then the other dude webby's no. just like super unapologetic yeah they're not remorseful they are sad that they got caught 100 percent. right uh, that's what i mean by that they're they're showing quote unquote mm -hmm. remorse and and the this scene is so or this chapter is so hard to read yeah because of the the callousness and the extreme bigotry that we learn is at the very center of dairy yeah this these sections are so rough because dairy dairy isn't kind to to anyone necessarily, but especially not anyone who's perceived as different. 
And what I liked, though, I thought was interesting about it is that I thought King did a really good job of highlighting the difference between acceptance and tolerance, too, because Mm -hmm. we have these group of boys who basically murdered this guy because he was gay. And then we have the police officers, several of them, um, one of them, the son of the guy who found Georgie, in fact, who are are tolerant but not acceptant. So even though they aren't right homophobic, although some of them I think are, their attitudes towards the gay community are just one of tolerance. And wow. At the very least, that is belittling, and at the worst, it is dangerous. There's one point where one of the cops said, like in his internal monologue, mm-hmm. he's basically like, I'm not a fan of having these people in our neighborhood, but they're still our citizens. It is our job to protect them, and we will not tolerate someone torturing another yeah. human being. And I feel like that moment really is a snapshot of where America was in that uh-huh, kind of uh-huh. time. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> when, yeah, just... Well, it's like... And, and people have that opinion and they expect a reward for being so like kind hearted. Yeah, but yeah. Don and, Oh, I'm I'm sorry. I was just I it bothers me because th- it's even more insidious than just not being accepting. Because in the very first section of this chapter, when we see Don or is it Dan? Don Don. Don shouldn't have questioned myself (laughs) uh don being questioned by the police and he's in tears and breaking down obviously and the police are just callously okay explain it again and he's saying i I, i've told you a dozen times they murdered him and the cops because he is a gay man are just like you're being hysterical he's not treated like a person who just who just lost someone he loved. Yes. He's and the officer, it's Officer Gardner, the son of the guy, he recognizes the grief and pain that Don is feeling. And this is why tolerance is bullshit. Because he he notices that and he's thinking, well, this guy, if you can even call him that because he's wearing makeup oh, and tight pants, yeah. I can't take him seriously. He's just a queer, is his words, what he mm. says. And one of the other officers, like you said, Josh, was thinking like, well, gay or no, you know, it's not right to kill people. Can we just not even have those qualifiers? Yeah, <laughs> like, right. no fucking shit. And it reminded me, because I love true crime podcasts, but people, you know, they'll be talking about a young woman or teenager who went missing. They're like, oh, and she was a good girl. She didn't do drugs or sleep around. Like, that somehow makes it worse to kill her. And I know that's not what they're mm. saying, but you got to think about how you are phrasing that and just tolerating people who make different choices than you or have different sexual orientations, et cetera. So, yeah. and if no one, like if you guys listening don't like that. Fuck off. I guess, yeah. <laughs> I'll take that bullet. Yeah. No kidding. Like, <laughs> so <laughs> fuck yourselves. So let's talk about this interrogation and what we find out happened. Long story short, these three bigots had gotten into a uh, confrontation with Don and Adrian at the the Canal, the Canal Days. Days Festival, which celebrates the canal, which brought people to Derry in the first place. And when they see Adrian coming out of this fair, he's wearing a big goofy hat, and they get so mad about it. Says, it says, I love Derry on it. They get so mad about it and are Irish cop, uh, not our Irish cop from the 50s who we do not meet yet. <laughs> well, and they're mad about it because Webby tried to win it and couldn't win it. Couldn't because... I mean, they're mad about it for a lot of reasons, but that's <laughs> yeah. part of it. It's, it. it's He takes it as an insult to his manhood. Right. And swears in front of a cop that if they ever see these two again, they're going to beat them. And if he's wearing that hat, it's going to be a million times worse. We cut forward some amount of time. But they see them again. Mm -hmm. And inexplicably, I don't want to victim blame, obviously. But just don't wear the hat. Adrian Adrian loves the towel. Obviously, he should be free to wear the hat. But it's just an unnecessary thing. He's not a friend. And Don talks about this. Mm -hmm. Adrian doesn't recognize the danger. His attitude, because he's not from Derry, is everywhere you go, there are people who are going to be horrible to us just because we're gay. Like, that's Mm -hmm. something we have to live with, unfortunately. And he doesn't think of it as 
anything necessarily out of the ordinary. And so he's dealing with it probably in the way he often successfully deals with it anywhere else, which is to sort of lean into it and, you know, bat his yeah. eyes at the guy and be like, well, hey, big boy. No, we see that Adrian is legitimately a cool dude. He's yeah, He sounds yeah. super fun to yeah. be around. Yeah, and he does, once he, he realizes, oh, this isn't just them giving us a hard time. This is dangerous. He's like, I will give you the hat. Will you please just leave us alone? And they do not leave them alone. And at this point, we also get the first of this kind of recurring through the book where as they're being harassed and about to get in this fight, a car drives past and the person driving acknowledges nothing out of the ordinary happening. And I took that as, and maybe because I've, you know, I'm familiar with the story, of course, I took that as not the person ignored it. It wasn't seen. There yep. was something keeping that hidden, which happens I, again that is later. What I thought. think they're both the same. I think both of those things are, I mean, the outcome is obviously the same either way, but I don't think it matters. Well, I don't I, think it matters whether they see it or whether they magically don't see it. It doesn't, but I think it's unique. Because they would have reacted in the same way. I think it's unique to Derry that mm-hmm. there's that element of something supernatural as well yeah. in them not seeing it. I, I just took it as a, a, a literary, like, really, really effective way of showing that this town is, it, it is not just these three hooligans mm-hmm. who are causing trouble whether that car saw them or not if they didn't see them that means that stuff like this happens so often that you don't notice an assault on the street well i was thinking they didn't see them because there's a clown nearby that yeah. might be <laughs> affecting people's That's ability to yeah see that was things. what i was thinking <laughs> yeah the, it was basically blocked from their vision by mm. it because it is about ready to get a meal to kick off its new cycle uh, as they're beating the hell out of Adrian uh, and they pull out a switchblade and are stabbing him, they mm-hmm. shove Haggerty back and he is like yelling for help. No one's coming. He sees he he has to stand by and hear this like they're they're clearly beating him bloody. It says they shattered his teeth. Oh. Did, did I miss this? Because when during this scene, it's describing Don having to watch as they shove him around in a circle as they shove mm-hmm. Adrian around in a circle. And then when they're done, they bum rush him and toss him over the edge of this bridge 20 some feet mm-hmm. into the water below. And it isn't until after his body is pulled out and the cops are interviewing these guys that it is revealed that he was stabbed like seven times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. From Don's perspective, we don't get that because he just sees them like pushing and punching him and yeah that, it, right? it wasn't clear to me and so what when happened, that yeah. is revealed that not only are his ribs crushed and his jaw broken and all of this stuff but one of them pretty obviously webby had been stabbing him too that's very scary and biting him well because there are well, bite, well there are bite marks that are different there, than the later exactly. bite marks. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, he has also a chunk of armpit missing. Yes. But I do not think that was any of them. And I always wonder, too, I think they would have beat him up no matter what. And they might oh, yeah. have also killed him. But I wonder if some of the other behavior was an influence of it. And just that it resembles mm-hmm. what it did to his body after it fell. So that's always just kind of a an interesting thing about this book. Like, you... It's hard to know what? what the influence is and how far it extends. My favorite part about this section, though, on a little bit of a lighter note, because this just is so <laughs> horrible and dark. Yes. There, they do talk about um, the gay community in Derry. And there's a, a bar owner, Elmer Curdy. Curdy? Yeah. <laughs> he's, so he's the owner of the gay bar, The Falcon. And he... Had no idea for years that it was a gay bar. I, I do love that in the middle of this very, <laughs> very violent, upsetting chapter. Yeah, there, we just meet a, a charmingly <laughs> clueless old man. Classic king. And that's, the only, some good, <laughs> that's some good king side character. The only difference he noticed about his patrons is that they didn't trash his bar like other bar and patrons. And beat the did. shit out of each other. And they yeah. tipped nicely. They're just the best patrons. His, his patrons. They just dressed a little wild. 
Anyway, the, I just like these stories. These two stories of death are really well done, equally as mm. heartbreaking and brutal. And they, I just like, because we're going to be going back and forth between these two pi- time periods so much that this is how mm-hmm. we kick it off. We're like, boom, 1957, it is, boom, 80s. It's so structured. The whole book, the structure of this book is so unbelievably good that it it perfectly balances Mm -hmm. the adult times with the childhood times that the fact that it could jump between those times when a recent book Dreamcatcher did the same thing (laughs) and it was confusing as fuck this wasn't post accident so i think yeah (laughs) yeah you're totally right (laughs) okay so we have these two murders Georgie and Adrian, and now we are going to meet the rest of our characters in the present day, which is, of course, the 80s, because as we're going to soon come to find out, Mike Hanlon, the local historian and librarian at Derry, and one of our childhood friends, is the only one who has stayed behind in Derry. And he is starting to notice something about not just Adrian's murder, but others as well, things that have been happening in the town recently. And he's about to make six phone calls, which will set five people on the path back to Derry. And we're going to start with Stanley Uris, kind of mm, (laughs) his wife, Patricia Uris. Yeah. So let's talk about why she's telling us and what's happening here. This, this section is the thing that I, we, we talk about great King side characters and great, King dives into backstories that really don't amount to stuff. We get Patty's whole <laughs> life story. I and I love it. I do it. too. It's I sometimes, absolutely yeah, love sometimes it. Sometimes it's a bog down. You're like, why did we have this? But and this is also, it at its finest. I feel really important because the relationships that each of our main characters have, mm-hmm. I haven't worked it out in my head yet entirely because it's been so long since I've read the book. But we are clued into all of their relationships and they're all so markedly different that mm-hmm. I'm glad we see Stanley's relationship with his wife yes. to compare and contrast with uh, some of our other characters. And through her, you you come to understand they're just a nice couple and Stanley mm-hmm. seemed like he was a really cool dude, somebody you'd easily be friends with. And we, we don't get to meet the adult Stan except through Patty's eyes, which I think is also really sweet. When we eventually meet him as a kid then, it is doing it that way makes it so that we only see Stanley through this perpetual mm. lens of sadness. Stephen King. <laughs> it, is, <laughs> it is so effective. And I, I still remember this part from the first time I read this book mm-hmm. because it shocked me. It shocked me to be going into this. It's our third chapter. We don't have a main (laughs) character yet. (laughs) We, uh, other than Bill, we can kind of assume Bill might be important, but up to this point, this is like the third or fourth important character we meet and he dies horribly. Stan takes an early bath after getting this phone call from Mike (laughs) and Patty's kind of been lost in her own world, watching family feud and stuff. She seems like a very nice woman. <laughs> she just enjoys simple she, life. Yeah. <laughs> She's kind of a dummy, you got. <laughs> she she does tell us that like Stan fucks. So good for him. <laughs> like she they they have a good life. The only the only thing that didn't work out in their lives is they couldn't have kids. Mm-hmm. That that's their every one of our older protagonists has some tragedy in their adult life. And that happens to be theirs. And it's attributed to Stan having been through something. Like, they acknowledge that it's his fault, like, weirdly. Yeah, they they go through a bunch of tests, and they can't find any... Anything wrong with either Anything wrong physically, but in bed one night, Stan gets uh, very moody and says, it's it's me. It's, something is wrong with me. And even though that doesn't make any sense, she, in her head, she's like... Yeah, she's but she's not, and it, it's not a blame thing, or it doesn't mm-hmm. cause strife between them as a married couple. It's just yeah. a point of sadness in their lives. But Stan's taking this bath, and she realizes he doesn't have a beer. She didn't hear the fridge open or close. Takes it up. Door is locked. He has never locked a door or in their entire life. Or shut it during life. a bath. Or shut it during <laughs> a bath, because he doesn't mind. And she... Oh, yeah, he doesn't mind because of the weirdest 
uh, that line I... <laughs> was he he uh, always kept the door open during his bath because what is it something like, to do with his mom yeah, something because his either mom. either his <laughs> is something he was doing something that his mom taught him to do or he's willing to do something that other women taught him to do and i was like uh, why <laughs> Are yeah, those let's, thoughts connected, let's Stephen King? Save yeah. That for Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> she gets a spare key, unlocks the door, and finds Stanley has taken a razor blade and slit his wrists lengthways and widthways and written it in blood on his wall. And it's baffling at this point because what we've seen of him through Patty, you'd think he would be the most stable of these other characters we're about mm-hmm. to meet, and he'd be like the rock. And... Super happy-go-lucky and yeah. ready for it. Okay, now we are going to meet Richard Tozier, Richie, a radio personality whose story, in comparison to what we just went through with Stan, seemed really boring and tame to me i mean it's not but i was just like man nothing happened there stuff happened (laughs) richie has the i feel like the most simple backstory it's just he leaves work (laughs) Uh, but i want to take a second at this point i don't know cm you usually do the audiobook route did you go the audiobook route this time i'm doing both i'm reading and listening it was this point where I noticed and would notice for the rest of the book, the guy reading the audiobook is fucking killing it. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. This is the best audiobook I've ever listened to. Damn. Now, I, coming up on Richie's part, I was worried because Richie's entire thing is voices. <laughs> yeah. oh, That's his whole his whole deal is that as an adult, we meet him. He's a radio personality. He's very famous. We get the the mm-hmm. feeling. And he's famous for doing goofy radio DJ voices. And I was like, fuck. <laughs> I'm going to have to listen to this guy do shitty voice. No. <laughs> this dude knocks every voice out of the awesome. park. And not just Richie. Every character is noticeably different damn but not like doing a voice different it is very clearly this guy's voice it's just changing it just slightly enough to differentiate the characters i i gotta look up what the guy's name is because he is uh an absolute master and can actually do a wc fields impression which is (laughs) impressive (laughs) So uh, as we go through these guys, I mentioned that they each have their own sort of tragedy that like their life seems perfect, but there's Mm -hmm. something wrong with it. And we find out kind of that Richie's and let me know if you guys agree or disagree. Richie's is being himself (laughs) like he because, he you know, he's a man of a thousand voices Mm -hmm. that this this whole thing is is like the person he calls to book his trip is like, hey, do a kinky briefcase, which is his. Sex Once again, crime guy. The I fact don't. that there's a character named Pinky Briefcase <laughs> that sexual attorney s- speaks in dumb jokes, <laughs> and it didn't make me cringe myself to death <laughs> is a, a testament. Mm-hmm. But he, when he is not doing voices and is in like the waiting part for all this, he is like bogged down. He gets like an intense mm-hmm. headache. And I feel like that is kind of showing his tragedy as he has had all the success, but he's never actually been able to just be himself. Yeah, no, I would agree with that completely. And a lot of what we get in his story as an adult, unlike what we just had, it's more giving us glimpses into their childhood, too, because he mm. talks about being in the sewer and stuff and, and kind of some some really creepy moments there. Yeah, because as as soon as Mike makes these phone calls... It is described later like a door opening in their heads. Mm -hmm. They don't remember anything about their childhoods. And suddenly they're remembering not only their entire childhoods, but some pretty traumatic shit. And recognizing that they don't remember their childhoods until just now. Because it's not like a thing that they were aware of or Mm -hmm. ever thought of. Now it's like, oh, that's weird that (laughs) I never remembered this. 
We get that a little more with Bill, but before we get to Bill, we're going to meet Ben Hanscom. And kind of similar to Stanley, we mostly get Ben in this section through someone else, a barkeep named Ricky Lee. The, the only issue I had with the audiobook was there's one paragraph where I swear he says the name Ricky Lee 15 times. <laughs> <laughs> but that that part, Ben is a badass. Ben He's is amazing. My favorite character in the book. Like, yes. not close. Yeah. Ben has become a famous architect uh, with a private jet where oh, he. Time. <laughs> where he flies home no matter where he's doing stuff he flies home every weekend and spends his uh, friday and saturday he doesn't just bar. fly home he flies hemmingford home ah uh, yes <laughs> yeah he flies in uh, goes through hemmingford home wearing his blue chambray shirt yep. mm-hmm. as he goes into this bar <laughs> and orders a beer stein full of wild turkey Oof. and lemon and squeezes the lemon up his nostril and then downs it in thirds. To be clear, that's not normally how Ben drinks. <laughs> he, <laughs> the, he is, uh, you know, Ricky Lee is describing that this normally just really calm, cool guy seems like he got the worst news that anybody in the world could ever get, and he's struggling with it. Yeah. And as as he leaves, I thought this part was really cool. Ricky calls out to Ben and Ben turns and he completely forgets what he was going to say because he's like shocked into leaping backwards because it looks like he's staring at a ghost. That happens with it's, everybody it too. Is, yeah. Everyone has this at least one point or like, I think Richie's was, uh, he takes some files out of his safe and he's like, ah, oh, good thing I wrote my own will basically. And mm-hmm. has this sense of I'm never coming home. Like they all have this, I'm never returning from this trip. And even specifically, I believe our next character, Mm -hmm. Eddie, also is seen and someone thinks, oh my God, that's a dead Mm -hmm. man. Yeah. So cool. (laughs) Speaking of Eddie, oh boy, you guys. Um, Oh boy. This is where I had my note about the narrator for the audiobook (laughs) because with Oh, with a good voice actor, there are just oh. some things you only get. Are you with talking that audio. about Myra? <laughs> are you talking about the one line? It's the best line reading <laughs> of he goes, but he stayed because it was easier, and <sighs> he loved her. <laughs> it is such perfect oh line. It is devastating. Oh. I it, have to pick up the audio book. It's so good. My Myra Kasprak is Eddie's wife, wow. and. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. And and I don't mean this in a shitty way, like or her character is so grating, but through Eddie's eyes, what we start to see of her, I have a lot of sympathy for her. Mm-hmm. My favorite part though, throughout, you know, he's some of these people who have spouses, if they do not kill themselves, are very abruptly leaving. And of course, it would be hard to react to that with anything other than I'm sorry, what? Mm -hmm. Why, why? Why would you be doing this? You have to stop and tell me what's going on. And so she's freaking out, understandably. But he he realizes at one point that it was okay to love her, even though she looked a lot like his mom and acted like her. And there's a really disgustingly poetic section where he refers to his, quote, Mm -hmm. oddly entwined lives as a son and a lover and a husband, end quote. (laughs) Gross. <laughs> and that's really Eddie sums it up well. I do not know why. I, I if someone went back through our podcast, I think Eddie Casprack's mom most might be my most referenced character. <laughs> yeah, it might be. She is the mom. She in is so the many king stories. Quintessential king shitty mom. Yeah. She sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and we find out that Eddie Eddie seems to be of all of the losers the least changed because he or le- the least grown i guess because he still has uh, his he packs a, his mm-hmm. entire medicine cabinet he even takes her medicine he just takes in her case my dog. <laughs> yeah <laughs> but he has his own limo service and so he, that's very successful he's actually supposed to be driving al pacino which his wife is very upset about the idea of driving al pacino because what if he's mean <laughs> Which I thought was great. <laughs> I thought this was that was interesting. The limo service. I, I didn't put two and two and together until they mentioned that he's driving Al Pacino or Robert De Niro. Whatever doesn't matter. They are the same guys. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, Bill Stanley, 
they're both massively successful. Yeah. And I was like, oh, and Eddie drives a limo, but he owns it. So mm-hmm. I guess yeah, that his makes limo sense. Service. All right. And, oh, God. Okay. Sorry. that We meet Beverly Rogan now. I was listening mm. to this in the car driving, and I was on, like, a backcountry road. And I had to stop listening because I realized I was so fucking upset that I was speeding and not looking at the road hardly at all. Oh I was like, God. oh, I, mm. I need to pay attention. This is important. Beverly's adult story is so, so infuriating and tragic. And uh, yeah, let's let's talk about Tom Rogan, her husband, who, <laughs> it, again, like we had Patty explaining Stanley and it showed us all these really wonderful things about him. Like her love for him told us who he was. We get Beverly through Tom, who's just an abusive piece of garbage. Mm-hmm. This section is proto Rose Red. He's very Rose, Red. Rose Matter. Yeah, it's no, it's like <laughs> he's very. I have to go home, guys. <laughs> he's very Norman Daniels. Yes. Yeah. And just the the arc of what happens here mm-hmm. of he's laying in bed and she gets a phone call and without thinking is already saying, "Book me a room." And tell him good luck or whatever it is. And yeah. he's immediately mad. And the arc of from that moment to her running out the door, literally running away and wandering the streets barefoot, yep. is follows Rose uh, Matter so closely. And it's really cool, too, because she previously we get a, a part where she had told him in the past one day you're going to kill me. You're just going to get out of control and kill me. And so we see her kind of resigned to that in a way. And then just in this one scene, we get to see her fight back. And it was just cool because it's like, wow, you know, someone going from he's going to kill me someday to this call that she got is so important Mm -hmm. that she just makes that flip. And she's like, nope, I'm never coming back. It's weird that, so I mentioned Eddie is the person who seems least grown. Beverly seems like the person who could never escape her destiny Mm -hmm. because she she marries her father. Essentially, it it mirrors Eddie in that way. Also wildly successful career-wise. Yeah, Mm -hmm. but at one point she says... uh, Designer. Yeah, fashion Mm -hmm. designer. And who in Tom runs her company for her because a man needs to be in charge. Mm But he, when Tom says the first time he smacked her across the face, the look on her, the look in her eyes was one of nostalgia as opposed to fear or pain. And that really sets the tone for Mm -hmm. the the escalation of violence. But when he, (laughs) when he tries to stop her from leaving, she throws all of her cosmetics at him, like in the face he grabs his belt and he starts swinging at her. She ends up toppling her dresser on him, taking the belt from him and beating him about his face and balls mm-hmm. with his own belt, which so was satisfying. amazing. Oh, right in the face and balls. Oh, oh God, it was so good. And it, it gave that those real Norman Daniel vibes of like, how is she actually standing up to me and is so enraged and baffled? And with Norman Daniel's delusion as well. Well, a different delusion. Well, no. uh, but he, as a, she starts to defy him, he becomes convinced that he's not really there. Yeah. That he he needs a reaction from her. He needs her to be scared for him to know that he exists. And he has a catchphrase like Norman, because Norman would say, we got to talk up close and he has to teach her a lesson. School's in session. Oh, gross. Anyway, she leaves him bloodied on the floor of their upstairs bedroom and runs away into the night into the night and now we're going to meet bill denbro again as an adult he is also married and he's a successful screenwriter his wife audra they met on set she was one of his actors and they probably have what i would consider the most amicable like Mm. hey this thing can't really explain it gotta go love you bye yeah well that's what i meant earlier when i was talking about all of their spite at spices (laughs) <laughs> what is wrong with me today? I don't know. <laughs> Spouses that of all of the the main characters, they all leave their spouses in different ways. Mm-hmm. Bill is the only one that communicates with yeah. their spouse. He is the only one that is like, hey, listen, 
I can't remember my childhood. It's crazy. How We've been together for how long? Tell me what you know about me. And she can't. Yeah, she's like, your brother died. He's like, ah, he was murdered. And she's like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. And he has physical proof, too, because the scar from something that happens way later we'll talk yeah, about. Yeah, he, he mentions some kind of ritual where they all cut their palms and uh, held hands. And they've been together like 14 years or something, and she knows the scar is on his body, and he holds his hand up, and it's there. And she's like, okay, yeah, that is weird. I have never seen that. I know that wasn't there. And he stutters for the first time in years. Mm -hmm. Another point of acting where even before he begins stuttering, the way the man reads the lines, you can feel the stutter emerging. It is... It's an astounding performance. I can't mm-hmm. talk enough. A next episode, I will have this guy's name because <laughs> I'm going to be talking his praises. And they also allude that Stan is the one who was responsible for cutting all of their hands. And Bill remembers it looked like Stan might might cut his wrist instead of his hand Ooh. when they were kids. Yeah, he, he he mimed cutting his wrist with Ooh. a piece of glass. It's a nice catch. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Finally, we meet Mike Hanlon. The guy making all these phone calls, bringing his friends back to Derry. But we start this off in a way that made me think of some of other King's work, like Carrie. And I I can't remember. We talked about one recently, and I can't remember which one it was. But we get the narrative through Mike's journal entries, Mm -hmm. which I thought was interesting because we could have had him, like everyone else has, just reflecting on these interviews that we're going to be talking about rather than going back again with our unknown narrator and getting him that way. It was just a cool switch that I appreciated. It like made the book a little more dynamic, I think. What did you guys think of this? I like that it switches to the the unauthorized uh, history of Derry because it's it lets you know that these are Mike's raw mm-hmm. uh, raw feelings it, about what he's documented so far. It, it gets us to know Mike as a person in an interesting way mm-hmm. because this uh, is a separ- uh, separate. Uh, chapter from the introduction of all of our all of our other main characters, mm-hmm. which I think is really smart because Mike is separate from all of them. He yeah. is the only one. He he's more or less been a sacrifice to Derry mm-hmm. because he has had to stay behind so he will remember. Mm-hmm. I also really liked the section on the different definitions of haunt or haunted because at first I was like, oh no is gonna be a thing (laughs) but it it was really cool and i think my favorite one was a feeding place for animals and he relates that to dairy itself being a feeding place for you know people like webby and his friends and some more people we're gonna meet later and mike also hears the voice of the turtle and he remembers of course like we said and he knows or he strongly suspects that his friends don't remember and he feels the burden of making these phone calls. He even puts it off as long as he can. Because he, he says this might kill one or more of them. Mm-hmm. I also like Mike's section because being the historian, we get that dairy history. I think it was Revival where we got some town stuff. Mm-hmm. And Salem's Lot. Salem's Lot. It's like stuff. the town itself is a character and dairy very much is also a character. It's actually said in the beginning uh, when we're investigating Adrian's death. Don says, uh, because he saw the clown, or no, yeah, Don yeah, saw Don's the clown on. because he even says, I the clown was dairy, mm-hmm. yeah, this is a poison place. And of course, they the cops don't pursue the clown angle because they think it could mess up their case. And we forgot to mention it's a nice bit of wrap up, these guys do get convicted, yes, but they do get released and are currently hanging out in the park, uh, yeah, watching girls. <laughs> We, um, one of our recent episodes, I think it was a Dreamcatcher one, we talked about, or maybe it was a bonus episode on Patreon, how for me, 112263 really made it very explicit that Derry was wrong. Like there was something very off about it. And I think there are other books that allude to that. And it's funny because reading this, like Mike very explicitly talks about how wrong Derry is. But I think I always attributed that to their experience with it, these showdowns. And I, th- I think 112263 makes you realize that it's more than that. It's not like a situational wrongness. It's in the town's bones and blood and probably what draws something like it 
to it. The wrongness isn't a symptom of the creatures that feed off of it. It's, it's the cause. It's the Marston house scaled up. Yeah. yeah. So that's just cool. I just, it's, it's so really fucking, fucking cool. cool. Yeah. Uh, this is where we find out that whatever it is our characters dealt with in 1957 and beyond is going to happen again. And this has been something that's been going on for hundreds of years. It shows up about every 27 years, hangs around doing awful stuff for a few years. And you can tell when it happens because its return to hibernation is always marked by this more like wide scale grand tragedy, which I can list them off if you guys. Yes, yeah, yeah, because okay. they're all fascinating. So I'm going to quickly list them off um, the ones that Mike has records of, and there could be more. So, well, first of all, the town, when it was very first established, 340 people were all of the inhabitants, and they disappeared without a trace in 1741. They got croatoed. Heck <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in 1879, a crew of lumberjacks found the butchered remains of another crew who had been snowed in that winter. In 1851, a guy poisoned his whole family, then ate a boatload of white nightshade mushrooms and died horribly painful death that part is scary because the guy that finds him thinks he has a wide white grin but it's actually just more mushrooms because he was eating as the cramps were tearing his insides he was was still in 1906 the kitchener ironworks exploded killing a bunch of people mostly kids because they were having children uh easter egg hunt at the time and it is explained that, like, a week later, someone across town finds a child's oh, yeah. head in their tree. With chocolate on his mouth. Uh, so he's eating chocolate. Uh, so gross. Nin- 1930, the black spot was burned down by the main legion of white decency, Barf. And, of course, 1957, where our story is taking place. And those are just the, the really big events. Because uh, we also find out a little beyond this. But in 1930... The year that the black spot burned down, 170 kids in Derry disappeared. 127 disappeared in 58. The murder rate of Derry is six times the murder rate of any other town that size in New England. Insane. And also shows that I don't think it would work in a modern day. So you don't think if there was a town where a hundred kids went (laughs) missing, everyone wouldn't be like, don't fucking go there. It would be all over social media, right? (laughs) Only if you know about it i guess mm-hmm. Derry has a what is the the quote that was either from this or from Dreamcatcher that the Derry has uh the art of forgetting yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. we also through mike's part get some more glimpses of some things that they went through as kids it, it's just like it doesn't necessarily mean anything to the reader right now it's like just a bunch of delicious foreshadowing But let's talk about what puts Mike really back on its trail. He goes to visit a retired head librarian, Albert Carson, to see who of the old timers still alive he should talk to about Derry's history. He's compiling all this information. And this is where we get a lot more discussion of Derry being inherently wrong. And this is also where we are at like part two of this book, which we're going to dive into a little more in this episode. Uh, but we're we're going to start to dive more for, fully into each of our main characters' childhoods around the time that they're all kind of being brought together by, by something. But we're going to start with Ben Hanscom because it's the last day of school. He is in fifth grade and he is in class with Beverly. And it's the sweetest <laughs> first love. It is so well written. I love it. <laughs> it's very, very cute. I really like their their love story. He... What I like about Ben's story is the the way he turns Henry Bowers into a mythical creature mm. from the get-go. We know this kid is the devil walking around mm-hmm. before Henry actually does anything even bad. Because he he has to take a test and Henry says, hey, let me copy off you. Ben says, no, so obviously they're mortal enemies now. And Ben must pay with his life. It's the fact that this is the first thing Henry Bowers does in this book. Yeah. (laughs) The first thing that this book's token greaser gets to do is almost murder the best character in the book. (laughs) uh, By by carving his own name into someone. Yeah. What's the end game there? He'll never forget. Do you guys? He'll never be caught. (laughs) 
<laughs> in in my note, I had that I, I feel like Henry is the most vicious of all the bullies we've read about. Absolutely. Oh, he yeah. He's just the worst. He is. If you thought Ace Merrill was bad, Henry Henry Bowers is Ace Merrill to the nth degree. Oh, oh yeah. horrible Christmas episode idea if you had to go oh, on a uh-oh. date with one of the greasers. <laughs> uh, don't give Josh fuck, Mary kill ideas. <laughs> the greaser dating game. <laughs> what, what, what's, what's great about the setup for all of this is that not only is Henry terrifying, but Victor, Chris, and Belch are big and scary on their own, and he has them... Mm-hmm. scared of him so mm-hmm. they'll do like the fact that the three of them stalk ben the rest of the day before yes. the attack is horrifying well can we talk about something nice for a minute we sure can i i just before ben has this encounter with them he's talking about beverly marsh and how he would steal her face in class like he'd cap he'd, <laughs> he'd, he'd take steal glances at her i guess is what that means but yeah and she talks to him the, yeah, on the steps of the school bump building. Bump into each other. Yeah. And she's completely normal about it. <laughs> she's, she's like, oblivious. oh, hey, Ben, what's up? And he's like, hey, uh, uh. the guy doing his voice at this part, his voice cracks. Like, oh, my God. It does a great good. job. And then he's, he's just like mesmerized by, as she's walking away, this the way the sun is reflecting on, on her hair. And Wh- which is? The glint of her ankle bracelet. And it's like that. It's described as that lover's eye cat. Catching every moment in things, you know, as mundane as an ankle bracelet. It's like, <gasps> here's a question. Yeah. How heartbreaking was this for you guys? Because in the previous chapter, during her adult introduction, Beverly gets the phone call and she's explaining to Tom about Bill. Mm-hmm. And she refers to him as, I don't know, maybe he was my first boyfriend. We and were you're too like, young for that sort of thing. Yes. Otherwise, he would have been, yeah. No, too young for a lot of oh, stuff. Don't oh, don't even. <laughs> Hello, part five, <laughs> part six. I, I found this, obviously, Ben, reading this book growing up, obviously, Ben was the character I uh, related with. <laughs> Not only did we have a similar name, <laughs> <laughs> but being a chubby kid and being a hopeless romantic uh, growing up. I I understood Ben really well. King describes his love for Beverly. We've all felt that as kids, that's Mm -hmm, sort of like silly, but unapologetic Mm -hmm. and like cranked up to 100. It's it's funny how different 10 years can be between a Ben and a Harold. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because yeah. this is yeah. a very similar feeling <laughs> that uh, <laughs> Ben has towards Beverly, but it is so much more pure and sweet. Yeah, and... like instead of trying to kill everybody for her, he just yes. walks away whispering his her name and under his breath. He, and... he even it's why Ben's character is so sad is like he doesn't even in his, in his fantasies, in his dreams it isn't even him kissing Beverly. It's like he is okay with just being like, this is just for me. Mm -hmm. I know it'll never happen. It's so sweet and sad. And then he gets pushed off a a railing. Well, before that, though, he's having a pretty good day. He finds change (laughs) on the ground, goes to the candy store, loads the fuck up on some candy. And that's the way you have to do it. Yeah. Right. Then he doesn't write a haiku. Well, hold on. Okay. <laughs> I, I really liked, too, he, he's buying candy, and he has this, like, thought, this little, like, thing that sneaks in there. It's like, Beverly will never look at you the way you want her to if you keep eating like this. But then he pushes that away because Beverly's, like, the sweet dream. Candy is a sweet reality. <laughs> and it, it's just more yeah. kind of, like, sadness and depth into his character. He also... That is the thing. He is the deepest yes, character Yes, he of is, absolutely. He goes to the library and he has this appreciation of the library that every diehard book lover Mm. can get behind. It's just so fun to read about. He's highly regarded by literally every adult that interacts with him (laughs) because he's just so polite and sad. Like they notice he doesn't have friends and they recognize, but he's such a good, cool kid. People would be lucky to be his friend, basically. So there's a a sign in the library about the 7 p.m. curfew, 
Love horror stories with the curfew. Yeah. This is just so good. We find out that Georgie wasn't the only recent death. There have been four others, and there's a lot of discussion about whether they're all connected or there's multiple killers, and maybe this one was killed by this guy. Yeah. So another killer took out this one. It's a drifter, and oh, it's a copycat of the drifter. <laughs> it's the yeah. early 50s symptom of everybody thinks that everybody's a runaway. Yeah, what's it's- that John Mulaney joke? about how easy it must have been to murder people in the old before forensic <laughs> science. Yeah. Boss, I got a body over here. Gross. Uh, before we get to what happens to Ben, an important part we have to kind of discuss is his conversation with his mom. So the curfew sign has made him think about what his mom gave him recently, which was this cool Timex watch because she's a single mom and he's a latchkey kid, basically. And, and she is so scared. She sits him down and has a, a grown-up talk about these child murders that have been going on, mm-hmm. which I can't even imagine how weird that sex talk is. Because <laughs> <laughs> she says that this might, they might be sex crimes. And he's like, I have no idea. What <laughs> well, that he means. won't admit. He's like, yeah. I'm not going to tell her I don't know what that means because I don't want to talk about the words in peace. <laughs> it's, and what's really, what really tugged at my heartstrings, though, is her, the point is Ben, you do not go anywhere alone. Go with your friends and mm-hmm. be home by 7 p.m. when I'm setting that table. If you are not washing your hands for dinner, I'm going to call the cops, probably for no reason, but that's what's going to happen. And so she gifts him this watch so he can be mindful of the time. And she's asking him if he's ever seen anything weird out of the ordinary or scary. But this part, man, you guys, it's so good. Her ignorance of his life has cost some trust between them. And he's also picking up on something else. Like he's thinking about, mom never called me fat. But she'd always, she always brings me leftovers while I'm doing my homework. And what's the motivation behind her behavior. He doesn't have quite, you know, that mm. articulate of a thought about it, but he's he's realizing like the things we all come to, oh, my parents are humans. They're real people. They're not perfect. They don't know everything. And I think when you first start to realize that, you lose that trust in them until you, you know, kind of get some insight and get older and regain that trust. But yeah. So well done. And Josh, like you said, Ben loves haikus just as much as we do. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's not how haikus work. Uh, <laughs> it, it, the way it, I'm not sure why this is the way it's posited, but if you look up what is the structure of a haiku, it'll tell you. What it doesn't say is it's 17 syllables, full stop, which is what Stephen King did. He wrote well, using the syllables, but not in the yeah uh, because it's a child. <laughs> because a child wrote it. It's a child's love poem. So, I think that's adorable. I, He's so, like, oh yeah, a haiku. I did it. <laughs> so Ben just thinks he did a haiku. Uh, do you wanna, <laughs> that is that is hilarious, actually. Do any of you guys want to read the haiku? Sure. Uh, I, I, like, I feel like yeah, anybody who's a King fan from, I, has well, it no, memorized. Don't do that. We gotta make sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is, your hair is winter fire. January embers. My heart burns there, too. Honestly, that is so beautiful. Even if I was trying to make a perfectly structured haiku, I'd be like, nah, killed it. <laughs> yeah. I think it's dumb, but that's like... I For a kid? I, no. For, for anyone. It, it could be an so adult beautiful. and I'd find it just as dumb. It's, if somebody it's gave not that it's me a that, kid. I would have died forever. <laughs> 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 okay, so Ben wrote this haiku because he's at the library and he sees a sign that says, libraries are for writing too, and they're a postcard. So he, he buys gets one. He's so excited about them. I love it. He buys one and no return address. He sends it to Beverly. And Ben, this is a part you're talking about. He knows she won't know it's from him, but he mm. thinks maybe she has a crush on another boy, maybe a boy in an older grade, and she'll think it's from him and that will make her happy. And that's good enough for Ben. All right, so now he's leaving and just daydreaming about Beverly confronting him with his postcard and kissing him. (laughs) And he doesn't notice that he is being followed by three assholes. So Henry Bowers and his pals, Belch, Huggins, and Victor Chris. So let's talk about, uh, let's talk about this confrontation. Uh, uh, They jump him, uh, Victor and Belch grab him by the arms, and Henry pulls out a buck knife, and he is like, Pop quiz. What are you going to do if anybody ever asks you to cheat? He's like, let him. And he's like, I don't give a shit unless it's me. What are you going to do if I ask you to cheat? And he's like, 
let you cheat. He's like, all right. But just to make sure you never forget, I'm going to carve my name into your stomach. And even his friends are like, uh, what are you doing? And they stop holding Ben. There's this moment where Ben, when he says that, Ben is actually relieved because it's such an insane thing to threaten someone with. And Victor and Belch start laughing. Yeah. And so they're like, oh, okay, this isn't We're just scaring him. No. But <laughs> nope. nope. It, and it's it's so horrific that Ben, his only recourse is to launch himself backwards off of, like, down this embankment. And unfortunately for him, they follow him, although he does get to kick Henry in the balls <laughs> and tower over him. And, and what was he, what did he say? I, like, that's right or something? <laughs> something like that. Just I know Henry says you broke my balls. And he's like... <laughs> Ben's just like, take it. Yeah, yeah, take it. It's the image of Bowers with the knife in his teeth sprinting oh. down a hill towards Ben who is rolled down and into a tree. So he's like defenseless for a moment and just seeing him, like that mental image of this kid just sprinting. And, oh, God's terrifying. Because any bully group, nobody would have questioned his manliness or his leadership if he was like, Oh, that kid's probably dead. Let's go, guys. Yeah. That was their opportunity to just move on because the kid fell off of this cliff. (laughs) Well, yeah, but Ben kicked him in the stomach and that is not going to stand. Yep. So Ben continues to run from them. He ends up hiding and he falls asleep, exhausted and scared. And I do love that he takes a nap. I know. He takes like two naps. (laughs) So for his first nap, we are- Also covered in blood. Yeah. Cannot stress- He oh, literally says up. his pants are full of blood. Falling down an embankment didn't help either. Sure. Yeah, and this is shredded. Yeah. So this is where we find out what happened in January that he withheld from his mom when she asked him if anything crazy had happened. Yeah. So uh, Ben had been hanging out at the library, helping the librarian. He was very proud of himself that the librarian wasn't double checking his work. Mm-hmm. But the librarian keeps him too late. Until it is after, it's after dark. It's winter, it's dark. so she keeps him, you know. Yeah. yeah. And there's this moment where you can tell that she, he can tell that she is scared. But she's an adult in dairy, so she's like, hey, you cool if you walk home by yourself? <laughs> well, she offers him a ride, but he's he's got a crush on her. So the idea of right. her husband picking them up, he's like, now nah, walk. <laughs> <laughs> So he begins to walk home, and as he's walking, he looks down into the barrens, and there he sees a figure who he he can't make out the face, but he can make out the silver clown suit with orange buttons and the balloons that are blowing against the wind toward him. That's (laughs) so nightmarish. It's such a simple detail Mm -hmm. that is because Ben is like, I. It took him a second to place, why are these balloons bothering me so much? And it was that they were blowing against the wind. Oh my goodness. I'd love to make some of those. Make balloons on like stiff strings or something. That's a great idea. So you can like put them at somebody. Yeah, you can like follow someone with them. That'd be really cool. A Pennywise calls out to him and starts advancing. And he then realizes that the clown isn't casting a shadow at all he's walking on the frozen creek below the Mm -hmm. bridge he starts to see that wait it's not a clown it's it's a mummy and a clown it starts like kind of taking this transformative shape and it becomes it's this moment is scarier reading than i ever remember it being it legitimately got Mm -hmm. to me and he'd seen the mummy on tv Mm -hmm. like the day before or something yeah it's really interesting and we'll get into it when we get to this the mini series and the movies but i think it is a tragedy that we don't get more forms Mm -hmm. of yeah of it Mm -hmm. and pennywise in the movie in visual mediums because in this it, it it's so obvious that it doesn't have a single form. Yeah, it has a favorite, <laughs> and then it. <laughs> but twists. even that changes because yeah. the ch- like the colors of the the clown change mm-hmm. depending on who's looking at it. Mm-hmm. And despite 
Ben's fear and his recognition that something is very wrong about this, a few things actually, he's still kind of falling under its spell the same way Georgie did. And the whistle for the factory blows and startles both of them and, yeah. <laughs> and saves his life. Yeah, it like looks up and Ben finally sees his face and it is the mummy. He's scared. Now he's taking off and he escapes it. So Ben wakes up from you know us seeing this moment and he can still hear these other kids that he heard when he was being chased. Henry and his asshole friends are giving them a hard time and Ben kind of hangs out and waits and they eventually leave them alone. They're like, no, we didn't see anybody. And so this is where he meets Bill and Eddie. And Eddie has a bloody nose for mouthing off, quote unquote. <laughs> and is having an asthma attack. An asthma attack. And Bill's worried he might go into a coma because <laughs> his aspirator's empty. <laughs> this is the one. I'm like, why is that the one thing that they decided to rugrats? Like, <laughs> honestly, I, the rugrats. I thought about that too, and I remembered some weird things I thought as a kid. That looking back, I was like, That's why? Fair. That made no sense. Um, so Bill asks Ben to hang out with Eddie, make sure he doesn't go into a coma, while he goes to the pharmacy to get a refill, and Ben agrees. So now we. We're kind of coming to the end here. We are with Bill as he is racing to the pharmacy on silver. And that's in the 50s. But also we're cutting to present day where he's racing through the uh, air on an airplane back to Derry. A silver oh. airplane. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I have a few things to say. First of all, it's very funny to me how big they describe his bike. The, yes, the impossibly <laughs> <Yeah>. large bike. <laughs> they keep it. describing this bike <laughs> as huge. And I don't know about you guys, but when I hear the word huge, I'd imagine bigger than me. <laughs> I just imagine an adult bike for a kid. Yes. So it's probably uh, too I was tall. imagining like one of those uh, penny farthings, the except, front wheel. <laughs> except both <laughs> wheels were that big. <laughs> and second of all, there's, I'll keep it short because this is my own thing. It sucks how King writes the bullying of Ben so well and so sympathetically. And it really makes you feel for this character when King is notorious for portraying uh, overweight characters mm. as mm -hmm. immoral or just bad. And so it's like, oh, that's that's cool that it's he's actually representing uh, an overweight person and like the struggles they go through. And then it immediately cuts to Bill sitting next to a big fat guy on the plane. And he's like, <laughs> this is the worst thing that could be happening. <laughs> and it's like... King, which side are you I on? I forgot here? about that part. Which fucking side are you on here, bud? <laughs> it, it got to the point where, like, it actually started to bother me. Yeah, like, it cool. started to piss me off in this. Specifically because of how sympathetic he writes Ben. It's and like, I know you can do better now. <laughs> Why? We got a question during our live stream this past weekend. Happy Halloween, by the way. Yay. Uh, of what we would ask Stephen King if we met him. I think that would be... I, I think that's my answer. Yeah, that's your, oh, yeah. Is hey, Stephen King, what the fuck is your problem with fat people? Anyway. As Bill is present day flying back home to Derry, he's starting to remember more of his childhood and also understanding the true inspiration behind his horror stories. And we also get a, again, a really good depiction of grief, a glimpse into his life at home after Georgie died. It was very reminiscent of. The, the family after uh, the kid dies in The Outsider. Mm -hmm. We talked about how cold a house can turn. It's so interesting to see how beautifully it's done here mm -hmm. and then seeing it in The Outsider, which is decades away, and it still hits just as yeah. hard. Mm -hmm. And it, he st King still it's, knows how to press those moments mm -hmm. the right the way. The scene where Bill walks in on his dad kneeling by Georgie's bed crying, oh, and he just thinks how much he wishes he could go over and just put an arm around his dad, but doesn't. And the three of them just go cry in separate rooms. Yeah, his mom is crying somewhere else, and he's like, why are they so far apart? Mm -hmm. You're like, yeah, oh it's God, so heart-wrenching. So we switch back to Bill uh, in the 50s, racing to the pharmacy, a lot of stuff about the bike that will just enjoy listening to it yourself. <laughs> yeah, it's there's an action sequence on this yeah. bike, Basically, and it's fantastic. It's illustrating that Bill doesn't consciously have a death wish, but he is 
being very careless and like blasting through intersections at like 35 miles per yeah. hour. It's cutting between a, a a truck and a bus yeah. at 40 miles an Ooh. hour. Yeah. It's pretty cool. So he, and this gives us, uh, this next scene gives us some cool insight into Eddie's life as well because he gets to the pharmacy and knowing that he is going to stutter more because he's freaking out and he's rushed, he just writes the pharmacist a note explaining what's going on and the pharmacist is like, yep, here you go. Don't worry about paying for it. I'll add it to their account. Get out of here. And it, it was cool too to see like the small town pharmacy <laughs> character put it on her account. knows everything. Yeah. And this is where we find out that it's just a place you go. It's not. Yeah. I listening back to this, I it was shocking to me how obvious mm-hmm. early on earlier than this point yeah. that Eddie's asthma is entirely a in his head. Of his mo- yeah, it's, it, her, it's, it's her in, sickness. Entirely anxiety and Munchausen by proxy. So Bill comes back and he saves Eddie from his coma and Ben bonds with them when he's very casually explaining like, oh, if you guys want to do a dam, because the bullies broke their their baby dam. Yeah, they were trying to build a dam mm-hmm. down in the Barrens. Because what the fuck else yeah, are you going right. to do? So Ben basically like draws up this blueprint of how they can build a dam. And they're like, how do you know? He's like, well, I don't I just do. Have you done this before? No, but no. it just makes sense. And they're like, he's never even cool. seen a diagram <laughs> of a dam. Never even seen one, and he draws what is a perfect representation of. He's one. never seen a damn diagram, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> so get out. This is also <laughs> a cool part. The boys are talking about how their moms are going to freak out because they're Eddie and Ben are all bloody, and it was fun and sad to see Ben being new to these two not understanding that Eddie's mom is crazy, and like Eddie and <laughs> Eddie and Bill are not going to be like, oh, my mom has this disorder. They're just like, well, my mom's going to take me to the ER. And Ben's like, oh, just tell her you're fine now. And he's like, yeah, that won't work. And then Bill changes the subject. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the camaraderie between Bill and Eddie and the friendship immediately with mm-hmm. Ben is so sweet. Yes. And as they're parting ways, so they're all walking together, Bill well, takes off. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think you're getting to the yeah, same point. Yeah, Bill takes off first, and then it's just Eddie and Ben and Now they're about to part ways and Eddie's like, see you later, crocodile. And Ben's like, all right. And he goes, no, no, no. He's not a jerk about it. I I was going to say. Yeah, see you later, alligator. After a while, crocodile. (laughs) Uh, I was going to bring up the when Bill leaves and Eddie turns to Ben and be like, Bill's got a stutter. You should probably shouldn't bring it up. Or you Don't shouldn't talk, talk about, about his, his brother, brother too. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just like such a genuine like, eh, yeah, that's we're buds. You should mm-hmm. know this about him. He's given him all the relevant information he it's, needs to, to be friends. Yeah. So we end with Bill, childhood Bill, who goes into Georgie's room because he this part's so heartbreaking. He the ghost of Georgie's memory and terrible death is haunting Bill. And it's weird. It's like it's a way for him to be close to him. But at the same time, he's trying to replace this horrible memory of his brother because he does have so much love for him. He doesn't want to remember him in fear. Mm -hmm. And so in December, he had been looking through Georgie's photo album and saw something very disturbing. And so he's going back to see if this thing happens again. And it does. He's flipping through... And there's all these great photos and the last page, the last page that will ever be in Georgie's photo album book is a picture of him taken 10 days before he died. It was a school photo. And then the photo comes to life and it starts looking at him. It winks at him. It starts talking to him and he slams it shut and he throws the book across the room and then it opens of its own accord flies back to that page and starts to bleed and blood pours out of this photo album it is horrifying and i'd forgotten all about this scene me too same it's so great (laughs) and all of this uh, like we this has set up so many pieces to where we will go from here. We talked about it before we went live to record that I feel like nothing happened and everything has happened Mm -hmm. uh, because of the the structure of this book. So revisiting it, seeing the order all this comes out and it's just, it has me so hyped because I do not remember the order in which the rest of the story happens. Now my memory is lying to me. It's like putting a puzzle together. Mm -hmm. It's, you know what the picture is. Yeah. But it's so fun. 
like puzzles. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we we most recently have experienced the adaptations, mm-hmm. which of course kind of changed the setup of everything. So I had also, I guess, I was thinking more movie as like oh yeah, there is a lot of back and forth and Mm. that just creates a a different experience. Not like better or worse. I mean, I prefer it just because I always prefer, but yeah. (laughs) That's it for this episode of Dairy Public Radio. As always, thank you for listening. Join us for our next episode where we will be covering chapter six through Dairy, the second interlude. For Benjamin Graham and CM Alexander, this is Joshua Khan asking you, can an entire city be haunted? Hey everyone, CM Alexander here. Thank you for listening to It Part 1. We hope you enjoyed it. And thank you again to our patron, Rachel Jansen, for selecting this book. Today, I have something different for you. It's a message from Josh about his balls. Hey everyone, it's Josh here with some hot news. Our It series has been sponsored by Manscaped. No, this isn't for our podcast within a podcast boner talk. This is the real deal. Manscaped let us get our hands on their new Lawnmower 4.0, and I have to tell you, it's a game changer. We talk about sex enough on this show that I'm not embarrassed to tell you I've spent years using my bulky corded beard trimmer on my man bits. A decision that has left more than a few unpleasant marks in its time. Now that I've used this sleek cordless wonder, I can never go back. If you're like me, I can't express to you enough the boost in trimming confidence their advanced skin safe technology gave me. And when putting a brand new blade to your balls, I think confidence in a brand is high on the priority list. Get a George Stark smooth trim, even if you're Thad Beaumont clumsy. Show that special someone in your life who's the real Thaddy Daddy. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code DAIRY at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code DAIRY. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. That's all for now, listeners. Goodbye.